tell you a little bit more about it. So Sarah, welcome to Super Lead Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Fantastic. I've been a, a fan of yours from a distance and, uh, you know, we've been trying to to schedule this uh, this this uh, interview and uh, you you travel and you'll be climbing for for months. <laughs> I'm glad that we finally got to connect. It's it's an honor. Yeah, I, I think the past after COVID allowed us to travel. It was yeah. time for me to finish a lot of the projects that were in the pipeline sure. um, and uh, hence the the travel, which I think will continue until the end of April. Uh, and wow. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. <laughs> oh, lovely. So I'm glad we found this window of time. So let's dive straight in. And um, on the podcast, we do like to hear a little bit more detail, your background. So um, you you do amazing things. But before that, do you want to just maybe just start us as early as possible? Just kind of give us a sense yeah. of of who Sarah is, where you grew up and you went to school and, and uh, to lead us to where we are today. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you once again for the opportunity. So I'm Sarah. Um, Niram Husi is my born name. I was named after my great grandmother. Uh, you <laughs> asked me, how do you pronounce uh, um, you know, my name? Uh, it's Sarah, yeah. very much African, long story behind that. Um, okay. I, was born, <laughs> I was born in Zambia, Lusaka. Okay. And uh, I grew up in the DRC. It was called Zaire at the time uh, because my mother was a single mother. So she shipped my sister and I to my grandparents who were missionaries there. Oh. But they're originally from Rwanda. So okay. until I was 13, I thought they were my parents. I called them Mama and Papa. I grew up believing I was uh, in Rwanda, obviously. I spoke in Rwanda, Kiswahili, and uh, um, Zaire was a French speaking country, obviously. I am one of seven girls uh, raised okay. by a single mother. <laughs> okay. um, I, the, the, the reality is uh, she kept trying because she was trying to find a boy. The, the environment yeah. was, was saying, you need a boy, you know, to look <laughs> after you. Uh, and oh, after wow. six attempts, uh, the poor woman decided it was enough. So she has six <laughs> girls. And, and she, she's very, I mean, she's alive very much uh, for you can do anything. And, and her thing was the sky is the limit. Yeah. I grew up in a missionary environment. My grandfather was a pastor, yeah. very much no skirt below the knees kind <laughs> of story. No skirt uh, above the knee. <laughs> no, no, no skirt above the knee. Everything must be below the knee. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, believing that they were my parents until I was 13 when I, I, I moved to back to, um, to Lusaka. Uh, sure. And that move was because we, we, we are Seventh-day Adventists, so we, we observed the, the Jewish Sabbath. So in the DRC at the time, school for high school, because I couldn't, there was no high school in that missionary school. So I had to go to a government school or private school, which would have forced me to go to school on Saturday. Um, so sure. going back to Lusaka, I had to I went into an environment which um, allowed me to to go to school only from Monday to Friday, and, and thereby observing the Sabbath. The, uh -huh. the the shift in the in the um, in Lusaka was that I went into a township, <laughs> so okay. where you didn't really know who the neighbors were. You know, <laughs> it was dog eat dog kind of thing. I couldn't speak a word of English. I mean, I spoke <laughs> Swahili, Kinyarwanda, and French. And kids are not very kind, you know. They they call out your yeah. accent, <laughs> you know. So I, I had to completely stop speaking French and try and learn English. And uh, and then I eventually moved to uh, um, Harare. I stayed. There was an aunt of mine who was married there, and she kind of took me in. I did yeah. my high school, um, so uh, all levels and A levels uh, in Zimbabwe. In fact, my yeah. my degree in accounting was was done there. I uh, then yeah. got married, moved to uh, to Joburg, and um, I have two beautiful boys. Um, they are now young <laughs> young men. I <laughs> I would like to believe, um, and yeah. they they are the biggest achievement in my life. Sure. They, they scare sure. me more than any mountain because there's a possibility <laughs> of having another person and, and, and almost carrying that, um, the, the consciousness that yeah. what they become, you have yeah. something to do with that. 
is sure. very scary and yet they have their own lives and they make their own choices um yeah. that's a bit scary so you it's uh, uh, you know the mountain when there's an avalanche there's an avalanche i mean it, it hits yeah. everybody <laughs> and, yeah. and not, it's not selective, but they they have their own little minds, and that that's very scary. So in the in the um, in Joburg uh, came twenty two thousand no nineteen ninety nine. Um, okay. I worked in the Department of Public Works initially uh, as a temp, which was yeah. uh, was fun, <laughs> but <laughs> I uh, I quit because I found um, it was a different culture. It was. Uh, like, you know, why are you worried? You will find it tomorrow, kind of thing, you know. So I, I quit and joined the first brand, uh, Ebux. I, in fact, I quit when they offered me a permanent position. But okay, it, okay. I was young and uh, also just believing that I, I, I wasn't meant for that environment. You know, I started a project, but I found it monotonous and I just wanted an environment where we're creating something that was um, different, not business as usual, you know. So I joined Evax as a temp. Um, I was there for three months and in my head, I was like, if they don't hire me permanently, I leave, you know. Okay. <laughs> we, we, used to, we used to have those um, newspapers. I don't know if we still have them on Wednesday, every Wednesday, you know, yeah. there, there would be like jobs. So, you know, two weeks before I was leaving, no one was telling me that they're hiring me and the PA sure. was the only black person at the time. And she would say, no, they don't hire people like us, you know, <laughs> this is 2000. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, if they don't, it's their loss. I'm, then I'm like, <laughs> you know, very close, strategically closer to HR with my newspaper, you know, <laughs> but I was hired, you know, and um, lovely, lovely. I fondly remember that environment. It's an environment yeah. that taught me um, how to be a corporate a person, sure. how to have confidence in myself. Uh, you know, I did say to you before the show that I'm an executive coach. It's an environment where I learned that a coach is a partner, other sure. than what I knew from school to say, if you get extra lessons, then you're not good, you know? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, that's really me. And then I found myself on the mountains, which is another story completely. Yes, so, so then, um... Yeah, let's start the story of the mountains because I think <laughs> you've done some great exploits. Yeah. I, I've interviewed your friend uh, Dushan Daisel, so so I want to. I'm keen to hear your path to the mountains. Yeah, so unlike her, I didn't grow up in an environment where I even knew what Everest was. So <laughs> climbing a mountain <laughs> is uh, <laughs> is something that we do. Um, like I said, I was at Ebux. I was there uh, yeah. for about ten years uh, in 2009. Yeah. Um, I was in the office at the time. At some point, I was head of spend. So everywhere okay. you spend e-bucks, uh, I looked after that. And then I thought, okay, I've done this for, for too long. I became um, a, an innovations manager. So we we actually came up with uh, ideas. I mean, first round loves its first thing, like what's something that we can do, you know? Uh, we, the team brought PayPal to South Africa. There's, there's, we no. did a lot of exciting stuff in that environment. And, and in my head, I was successful until yeah. one fateful evening, I got a call to say my older sister had passed away. I did say we were sure. seven girls. Sure. And, and I remember just thinking I was in the office and it was around seven o'clock in the evening and thinking, yeah. what just happened? You know, had sure. she achieved her purpose? You know, like okay. lots of questions. And, yeah. and uh, you know, coming, being confronted with my own mortality uh, sure. effectively, you know, mm. and, and wondering whether, you know, going back to my grandfather, who I said was a preacher, and he used to say, you know, if you don't live a life of service, it's a life wasted. Sure. And, and I, I questioned myself, am I living a life of service? And the answer was no. So am I really successful? Sure. It just sure. didn't feel like, you know. Then I thought about my mother, who always used to say the sky is the limit. And I wondered, am I reaching for the sky? And sure. <laughs> I didn't feel like I was. Sure. So I started really for the lack of a better word, auditing where I was <laughs> as opposed to where I ought to be. Um, yes, and, and in a state of confusion, really, I uh, I quit uh, my job. Uh, I like that. Yes. Um, yeah, I quit four months after that and I went to work at the post office. Um, and, and, and there was logic to the madness. At the post office, we there were, were all these groups of people that had come from Fish Rand, from Standard yeah. Bank, and we were going to make Postbank uh, the bank for the people. At the time, 
I'm sure you remember there was this Mzanzi account that the big four mm -hmm. banks they were for at the time didn't mm -hmm. think it was a profitable product. Um, but the idea was if Sadak, we thought Sadak will open up one day, all these people that will come from around the countries where you are, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and everywhere else, they will be the Mzanzi account type of people. Sure. So who's going to service them? So we wanted to actually be ready to do that. And, and I felt that this was it. I could participate, get be part of a team that helps our people understand wealth, you know, sure. and uh, that felt purposeful and, and it yeah. was enough for me to just leave working for for the money and you know and the shares and, and whatever which admittedly it was probably an emotional decision right yeah. but um it, it 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 felt good at the time you know yeah. um, yes. i didn't last unfortunately i was there for 11 months uh, it's, it's an interesting environment if you've come from from a corporate environment where the bottom line is king you know, is yes. it going up, is it going down? It is this environment which is so unionized <laughs> with people that are meant to look out for the future of the business, but they're telling you that, Sarah, we've been doing this for 20 years. It oh. works like this and you're like, but when did you last send the letter? Are we in the letter? Oh. Because, you know, so, oh. you know, and eventually after 11 months, I did some good work with other people there. Um, I was headhunted at uh, Discovery and uh, oh. they were building the bank. I was employee number two. And, okay. it was exciting. And, and in this environment, we were actually going to do, it's almost which they've done brilliantly, uh, yeah. almost like a vitality, but for money. It's also yes, making yes. people you know, understand wealth and, and, and so forth. And it felt, I can actually tell you since then, every job that I've accepted has yeah. been, um, has gone through my own uh, process of, is it aligned to my value? Is wow. it creating an impact? Um, sure. What change is it making? Whether it's me sure. or other people within the business, but I just yeah. want to be part of something that leaves the world just a little bit better. Then I found it, you know, um, and but something completely different, nothing to do with the work that happened there. They encouraged, uh, which are prob they probably still do, employees to adopt different causes, yes, whether it's animals, um, you know, children, whatever we are passionate about. In our department, they had adopted a home called Kids Heaven in uh, okay. in Binoni, so they look after street kids. And yeah. at the time there was chaos in Zimbabwe. There were lots of, uh, you know, uh, street mm -hmm. kids from the RC locally. There were just yeah. lots of street kids. And, and they would encourage, don't give them money, you know, rather send them over and they'll look after them. They had between 180 to 200 street kids uh, sure. in the home at sure. any point in time. They would yeah. just rehabilitate them, take them to school. And we, every at the end of every month yeah. would, you know, uh, ask for contributions in the office and we take these kids for a hike. Yeah. The ones that are, oh. yeah, the ones that are, uh, uh, you know, in matric, bring them into the office for interview etiquette. So take yeah. them to museums. Uh, yeah. I'll take my kids, other people will take their kids, show them the family unit, you know, that sure. they, they are not forgotten. So it was, mm. it was a nice thing. Yeah. But every second month you go around asking for money, people, are just tired. There's donor fatigue. <laughs> They're like they pretend to be working, you know. So somebody said they were climbing Kili, which was on my bucket list. Um, and okay. I said, I want to come along, you know. And when we were training one day, I said, you know, why don't we use Kili to raise money for kids heaven? And that way we're Lovely. not begging. We are no. sharing the experience. So we're selling the experience to people that may or may never do it um, no. in exchange for, you know, some money. And we it was actually the biggest, um, you know, fundraising that we had done since I was okay. there. We raised okay. enough money to build an outdoor gym worth about 200,000 rand. No we converted a, a garage into a library because they needed a place to do their homework. Um, and yeah, it, it was just, it was, it was, it was amazing, something small. Now, although the summit happened on Kili, something actually shifted, which caused me to climb mountains, which led me to where I am today, we were handing over and one of the kids in the home said to me, do you really come from the township? You know, I've, I've actually done a TED talk on this. Yeah. I initially thought it was a joke, you know, the black people swim, I'm sure you've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so I just laughed and said, yeah, what do you mean? She's like, 
No, because people like us don't do things like this, you know, and then so, I realized she was serious and said, but who does? She says, no, exchange students that come from Europe and the US for a month or so, when they go back, they're the ones that do things like this. You know, wow. I, I actually came home and I reflected on that. And, and I, I, I saw myself growing up watching Wonder Woman and Superman and thinking they're epic, but they don't look like me. They're flying around. Sure. I can, sure. they're yeah. those I can admire, but I can never be them. A sense sure. of self disbelief yeah. that that child had, you yeah. know. Yeah. But what shifted for me is somebody invested in my education and, and, and yeah. needed to shift for her as well. And, and I started questioning whether I was doing enough to show my boys that help comes sure. from within before yeah. they looked elsewhere that yeah. they too can do anything. You know, yeah. they don't have to depend on others that are, are, are heroes and they are not. So yeah. I made a conscious decision that I will climb the seven highest peaks around the world. In the Just like that. Yeah, in the seven continents, but I, I didn't even know the, 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 uh, the details. <laughs> and I would use it <laughs> to raise money for education because uh, I believe it's the equalizer. It's, it's, sure. it's yeah, the reason true. I think that no one around the world would come and make me feel inferior or make me feel mm. that there are things that I can and cannot do. Mm. Um, I believe we are equals. Yeah. How can I make sure that the next generation also yeah. step up? They yeah. also believe that they can lead the world just like any yeah. other you know, child. And, and sure. you know, as I, I said, I'll raise money for education. I'll focus on changing the narrative for the next generation of Africans. And uh, I, I haven't looked back. Obviously, I, I started investigating. So how do I do this after making yes, this? Yes. <laughs> so where do we start? You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but look, that decision, I know when I started, I used to say I'm just an ordinary African woman trying to yeah. reach extraordinary heights, sure. which has changed. I am uniquely extraordinary. Oh, and being Sandy. ordinary is a choice. And I believe we are all uniquely extraordinary. We were made for a purpose at this time for a specific reason. I think the, the idea is to focus on what am I here to do? Because yeah. only I can do it better. And we sure. all can leave the world a lot better than we found it. You know, and yeah. I've been able to raise over 2.7 million rands. I've, I've built mm -hmm. five Mandela libraries, over eight digital libraries. And, and if I can do that, what can we do as a collective? You know, sure. my challenge many times is, um, you know, especially to women, there are women that walk to the union buildings in the 50s. That's why we're 50% yeah. in parliament. I think I can climb the <laughs> tallest mountain in the world. But what is our generation going to be sure. celebrated for? Sure. You know, sure. I, I, sure. My thing is, it, it's, it's actually representation is making sure we shine in the corner that we've been given responsibility for. It's making yeah, sure yeah. that we are leaders that we are meant to be. And, and, sure. and by that, I don't mean we need a big corner office, yeah. you know, because I believe that everyone is a leader. So the corner that yeah. you've been given, shine it to the extent that the next generation, when they take that corner, it's yeah. assumed that they are very good at that, you know. Um, I mean, the reason people make assumptions say these people are lazy is because they saw one person. Yes, yes. That yes. shouldn't be you and I. Yeah. Wow. You okay. shouldn't be the reason why they say they are great podcasters, you know, sure. they are, and they give the confidence to hire my yeah. grandchild because you yeah. did a good job, you know. Oh, standing, <laughs> standing, standing. So, so now, um, Dushan talks about this thing when you have to climb the mountain, there's like, you know, you go up, you go come back to base camp and, and it sounds so complex and difficult. Do you want to just give us like a five minute intro to climbing or summiting yeah. one of these big mountains? Yeah. So, so climbing high altitude mountains um, is, uh, is really about acclimatizing. It's, it's okay. making sure you have enough red blood cells to be able to survive at, at reduced um, oxygen levels at high altitude, where the oxygen levels, for example, at Camp 3, they say is about 44% what you find at sea level. And, sure. and the only way to do that is to climb high and you sleep low. So they're called rotations. Okay. And, and, and when you do rotation, when you climb high, your body, because there's reduced oxygen, is forced to produce more red blood cells. I right? see. And then yeah. you come back down 
And then yeah. when you go back to that um, to that level, you are yeah. already uh, acclimatized. You, you, acclimatized. Your yes, body yes. is comfortable with the yeah. reduced oxygen because it's got enough red blood cells. And that's what's called um, rotations. Um, yeah. It's important to do before camp three, which is about 7,300, because it's believed after camp three, um, the effect of rotations is off. You either are climbing without oxygen or you use supplemental oxygen. So okay. climbers uh, always, even whether it's, uh, um, you know, going to every space camp, you climb, you get to certain villages, you rest, you do an active day, you go up, you come back down. Um, but, but there's a lot more to it than, um, you know, than just a simple climb up or climb down. Some people have studied this and they've looked at uh, what altitude should go up for and then yeah. come down. And yeah. what effect does altitude have on, on the body? People start, yeah. uh, you know, bleeding, nose bleeding, yeah. um, headaches. Um, yeah. You need to, you, you get dehydrated very quickly. So you need to hydrate quite a lot. Um, yeah. When it's quite bad, it can turn into pulmonary edema. You start hallucinating. Sure but you don't want it to get to that level. So you need to, uh, you know, to be patient when you need to be and yeah. be ready when you need to move high, um, yeah. you know, and, and, and apart from that, once you're fully acclimatized for a mountain like Everest, you come back to Everest base camp and then yeah. you wait for the right weather window, which um, okay. interestingly enough, I, I mean, it's such, it's such a process that you need to be strong, but you also need to be patient Okay. In your patience, don't be lazy because when the window is right, you must be ready. So, okay. so you find people are actively uh, training while they yeah. wait for the weather window, which, which is yeah. something that I used during COVID. People were like, we are locked up in the houses and complaining, but, yeah. but you could be improving yourself so that when the world opens up, wow. you, you are better you. You're ready wow. to actually yeah. not yeah. just survive, to thrive. Yeah. You know, I, The mountain for me, I can tell you, has taught me so many lessons. It's uh, made me well, a let's different go, person. Let's, let's, uh, let's go through a few of these things. One, two, or three. <laughs> you know, um, and I, I believe you, some of these lessons are in your book. Uh, so yeah, I put a few, um, I think. Uh, I think, yeah, I put a few. Uh, it's uh, a memoir and also obviously lessons that I've been able to, to learn um, along the way. Um, some of the, the lessons is what I just alluded to about being ready um, and not being complacent. Um, you know, maybe let, let me go back uh, without it being ready. In 2014, when I first summited, I don't know if you're aware that I attempted four times. I mm. only submitted on the fourth attempt. So on the first attempt, when I rocked up there, look, I'm black and I'm female. Um, so the assumption was she must be going to Everest Base Camp, right? <laughs> so initially, um, it didn't bother me. Then it started bothering me because then I wanted to prove to them that I belonged. Yes, um, yes. I changed my game plan. I was, you know, hiking a lot faster, pulling a, a bigger weight, like just you know, so that they can trust me beyond Everest Base Camp. Then when we got to base camp, I was in the first team to get to base camp. Yeah. I was so tired. Um, <laughs> I slept for like three days. The only thing I would read and I would go and eat, read and go and eat. And then they said, let's acclimatize on a, a mountain close by called Mount uh, Pumuri. So we're going to higher camp. Yeah. Just 200 meters above Everest base camp. And yeah. I crashed. I had terrible altitude sickness sure. because I became complacent. I, sure. I, I changed my game plan. I, oh. I, tra I, I, I climbed high to show other people that, you know, uh, yeah. that didn't train with me, that sure. had a different strategy. I changed it to fit in. But sure. when it was called for me to go further up, I completely, I mean, they, they got to higher camp about an hour and a half before I did. When I got there, I was puking. I was completely finished. And, and I think it just taught me how not to be complacent, you know. Sure. It's, sure. We can celebrate the wins, but we must keep the eye on the ball. And wow. we also must be very much aware of what is the plan? What, what is the end goal? Is it Everest Base Camp? Because if it's Everest Base Camp, that strategy would have worked. Yeah. But it was better than Everest Base Camp. Sure. So you can't finish. You First of all, you can't go and start copying your competitors because you sure. don't know what their game plan is because that's sure. what I did, right? And, and you, also, <laughs> you also can't just, you know, change 
without taking into consideration the effect of that change on the end goal. And, sure. and that's something that every leader needs to bear in mind because yeah. you have these group of people and everyone has got a, a plan, everybody's got, a, everybody's got a brilliant idea, especially if you have uh, eight type people in the room, how do you make sure that they remain focused on the, yeah. on the end goal? You know, okay. um, the, the other lesson that, that is quite important is, and, and which is why actually as an executive coach, I use Clifton, which is a strength okay. finder. Yes, yes. I think it's, for me, it's important to lean yeah. into your strength and identify um, or accept the fact that everyone in the room has strengths. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, focus on your strength and manage yeah. your weaknesses. And yeah. that's not how, I don't know you, that's not how I, I went to school in yeah. private. It yes. was like, you're not good at maths, remit your lesson. That was like, it's not like, but you're good at English, focus yes. on writing books, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> it's the simple example that I give is Casta Simenya and, uh, and mm. Usain Bolt, they are runners, they are brilliant. Yes. Why would you want them to compete with Chad Lacroix in the, in the pool? <laughs> <laughs> so their energy and their time and their talent. Yeah. So, so I came back and, and I was looking at my team, it didn't matter how junior the person is, I looked yeah. at their strength and I called on them to lead at a specific point because they effortlessly would do strategy because that's something they're strong at. Uh, they would effortlessly manage a relationship because they are kind of a relator. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's the same with Everest Base Camp. You find type A people, CEOs of listed companies, they come there um, and they look at a shaper and think he's not educated. They want to tell him how, how things are going to happen. He has been climbing that mountain, understands the, you know, it, it's a simple thing, know when to lead and when to follow. Sure. Just because I'm following in that moment doesn't make me less of a leader than I am. Excellent. You know, um, Excellent. I, I, I think for me, that's, that's quite fundamental. I'm gonna give yeah. you the last one. Um, I just, uh, I did Mount Denali in, um, in Alaska, um, you know, and the, um, in Alaska in June. Yeah. One of the things that happens there, you pull a sledge, you carry your own uh, backpack. So the food that you eat for 21 days, you carry like the yeah, oh. tents, you pitch your own. So it's hectic, it's hard labor, it's harder than Everest that it was for me. Um, and, and, and one of the things that I picked up, people were like, oh, teamwork, teamwork, let's put the tents together. Once their tent is up, they end the teamwork. It's just talking, <laughs> you know? And, and one of the, the uh, um, I wrote a WhatsApp after we finished. The observations I made is that shouting teamwork and saying this is our philosophy or this is our, our value doesn't make it so if there's no, no acknowledgement that today my teammate only can give 40%. I will give mm. 60, sure. knowing that maybe tomorrow they will give 60 sure. for the benefit of the goal. So teamwork, wow. I don't believe is a 50-50 game, but that's what we taught. If somebody's not pulling their weight the same way, then yeah. you know we all put the tools down, but guess what suffers? The summit, the objective. Sure. You know? sure. and, and I think it's, it's the simplest way for me is bringing in Ubuntu sure. in your leadership, which is something that we don't do. We've thrown away everything that makes us African, that makes, made the old leadership work wow. traditionally and embrace wow. these things that are all, you know, you must give 50 and I'll give 50. That whether it's scientific, I don't even know what it's called. I think they are brilliant, but yeah. there is stuff um, that we've had that are very much what makes us abundant that we yeah. need to bring into our leadership and make a difference. I think we shouldn't be scared if those things wow. are right. No, love that, love that. So um, th there's most people are thinking about the idea of being resilient, even as they go into the new year, because I think we have learned that, you know, anything can be thrown our way. I imagine climbing the mountain and the avalanche and all these things coming through, hitting you from left, right, and, and, and otherwise, how do you stay the course, you know, and mentally, how, what happens mentally for you to say, I'm going to take the next step and the next step, even in the midst of the winds. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I just see on, on TV some of these shows. But I'm you should read like... my book because I went through all that and more. Um, 
the Simon Sinek says it, says it well, you know, start with your why. I think oh. for me, understanding why I was there, you know, um, made it possible for me to take the next step. And it's not just about the summit. Remember, 2014, I didn't make it. I came home and I had raised enough money to uh, feed kids at school, about 62,000 or 63,000 children. So that for me was a summit because the reason I was climbing is not for the selfie. It's yeah. so that I can make a difference. And I was still making a difference. If yes, you yes. understand why you're doing what you're doing, why it's important to you, you'll make yeah. a plan. You'll fall, you'll get up, you yeah. take lessons from that, failing forward, I would say, and you keep going. A sure. simple example, if you are going to Pretoria, you're on the highway and there's a big accident, yeah. you'll find Old Jobbik Road and get to Pretoria if it's that important. If it's not, you're, you're relaxing the highway and go back home because it's not that important. So the reality for me is that for you to be resilient, what you are fighting for must yeah. be important. You must, there must be clarity of, of, um, of vision of why you are doing it, why it's important to you, why it yeah. matters, because yeah. you go through the extra mile of finding the right people to make sure that it's a success. You'll be sure. able to let go of strategies that don't work, even though they may have worked yesterday. You'll sure. be able to let go of relationships sure. that worked yesterday, but they are not going to work for that summit because okay. it's that important. And, and wow. I think it's, it's that simple. Why is it important? Okay. Climbing for me is, has become a little bit more than just about me. It's about making a difference. And that gave me the strength to go back even after my accident, after being left for dead in the death zone, after the earthquake on the mountain. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and I think the reward, uh, one of the memorable things, maybe I should actually send you the book, is um, yeah. getting up on the fourth attempt um, and, and looking out there. And remember I said, my mother always used to say, the sky is the limit and, and realizing yeah. how wrong she was. Wow. You know, because I was standing above the clouds, someone like me, 66 years after the mountain was first summited. And the, 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 there is power in continuing to step and understanding, learning from every cave boy and every fall that you take. It's only a failure if we don't learn from it and, and use it to step forward. I, I know I, I had all this thing. I mean, I had written proposals over 200 asking for funding. And we told you, oh, who's the man taking you? What makes you think no. you can? And all sorts and, and silence, of course. Um, no. When I got up there, I realized, no, they were not shutting doors in my face. They were closing small windows because the gate was wide open and I stepped wow. right into it. And sometimes we are paralyzed by, by the simple fall and the negativity that comes with it, um, yeah. that we fail to see the positives, the, 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 the learnings that happen for us. Maybe that's happened because you're not ready. I believe I'm a different leader, I'm a different person because I attempted four times and summited on my fourth attempt. Wow. Than if I went in first time and just got up there and, um, and did it. You know, I, I, I'm very grateful, I'm thankful for all the, the attempts that didn't work out because they made it possible um, for me to get up on the on the fourth attempt. So Looks I'm like still here. Where are I'm you? still I'm still here. <laughs> the the Lord shading in in, uh, in here has, has hit. Uh, oh, okay. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. I just can't see you. So <laughs> you want to continue or you want to wrap no, let's up? continue. Let's continue. Um, <laughs> I can just see the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay if we, we continue later if you want to. No, so they, I think they were dead load shedding and they had generators. So I think now the generator is, I don't know whether the diesel is finished, but let's go. Um, uh, but, but I still can't see you. Are you comfortable with that? I can only see I'm, you. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy because we, <laughs> the, the main one is the audio. Um, and okay. then we do the videos. Um, um for fantastic no problem i can hear you clearly so let's do this okay so no but i'm curious so i mean many of us might have the why right and it's big you know we want to serve the world in some way but in the moment when 
when someone screams in the in the meeting room and when someone says something that that's demeaning and yeah. some sometimes we do forget the big goal uh, and perhaps you know like we settle for a smaller fight than than we should actually be engaging in so i just wonder in the moment in the storms and the earthquakes and all the rest of it what what do you say to yourself so i i, I fail sometimes as well um, I, I know one of the things that I've uh, decided on for the past few years is I'm going to smile and wave if I think <laughs> somebody, somebody's approach or, or, or their thinking or, you know, um, they, they, their um, approach to anything doesn't align to my strategic objective or, or it's just out of order, um, no. I'm going to smile and wave. <laughs> um, but there are times where, when the smiling and wave just uh, goes off the window and I just lose it, you know. Yeah. I, I think we are only human, right? Yeah. Um, and every now and again we fall there. But um, it's important when I fail, I reflect on it. I go back. If I need to apologize, I will. I get yeah. back on course. The, yeah. the point is there will be no obstacles at all. The point is there will be obstacles. When yeah. I fall, how do I get up and still go, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think having a, a big goal is important. I yeah. always break them down into smaller goals. Yeah. And I also celebrate the small wins, you know? I know that when I came back from some of the climbs and it, it was unsuccessful, people would say, ah, oh, shame, I, you tried. There's nothing shameful about trying. The courage to start is what is important, right? Because there are many people that will go to their graves without realizing a quarter or an inch of their potential because they were just so afraid of sure. trying, right? Yeah. I am going to try and I'm going to fail. I know that even after this call, right? Yeah. But I will never stop learning from those sure. mistakes because wow. I believe that they're happening for me. So I know that, you know, look, I'm a Christian, so I'm gonna tell you one of the things that keeps me sane is uh, a verse, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It says, oh, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, it's plans to prosper you. So despite me and saying, why me? And da, 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 I go back to say, this is to prosper me. So let me figure out what I need to learn from this. Sure. And I always, that makes me take the next step and keep going. And if I don't understand it, and I, I know that I'm just, I need to figure, I become obsessed about what I need to learn from this interaction until I understand it and I get the clarity to move forward. And maybe I forget it because I'm busy celebrating the next big win. <laughs> you know, um, I, 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 it's, it's, don't be afraid to fail. I think this is the bottom line because sure. you will. So let's talk about fear because I imagine uh, where you're climbing these mountains, it's not like nice and neat. Um, like, like, like perhaps our backyard. Uh, so, I'm, how do you handle the fear of? I, I mean, I imagine there's danger. There is all these things that that you're faced with. How how do you overcome that fear and go back again and say I'm summiting again in April and I'm going back again in August? How? Um, it's simple, you know. We are all going to die, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, just because I'm afraid of it doesn't mean that I'll be excused, you know. <laughs> um, the question is, would you have lived before that time came? You sure. Know? And, 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 and it's, uh, I think for, for me and, and my boys, I always tell them I'm going to take life-preserving steps. I'm not going to take any unnecessary risks. Okay. But I'm also going to be, to learn. I mean, I, I went to the French Alps to learn how is this done? I mean, I had never been uh, in the snow and, and stuff like that. It's learning as much as you can and being as ready as possible. Uh, okay. But accident will happen. In Denali in, in June, I was, um, you know, going behind, like climbing behind uh, the leader and suddenly he disappeared. I mean, I could only see a quarter of him because he fell into the crevasse in front because it had snowed so much we couldn't see. So we're trying to find where to walk and the next thing this man is gone and he's rocked onto me. Now, if that crevasse was so long, he would have pulled me with him. 
So it's sure. just being very vigilant. You, you don't go around with earphones, you listen to everyone around you, you listen to the cracks in the snow and you train. It's irresponsible to rock up on Everest and you didn't train because you're not only putting your life at risk, you're putting the lives of other people at risk. Okay. The other simple lesson, the first three times I went cheap because I was paying for myself. I'm like, okay. you know, it's realizing that, you know, mm, cheap will kill you. <laughs> go, with the right, go with the right people. Surround yourself with the right skills, even if they are cleverer, they are better climbers than you are. Yeah. The point is to get yeah. to the top of the world. Surround yeah. yourself with the right people and the wrong people, let them go. Sure. Because maybe they belong on, on, you know, on Everest Base Camp. I mean, I'll ask you a question. I'm sure you loved your grade seven teacher. Did you yeah. take them to university? No. No, 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 no. Does, That doesn't mean you love them any less. They were sure. good for primary. You moved sure. on. Yeah. Take the, the high school and tertiary education teacher to be where you are. It's the same sure. thing. And, and I find that we, 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 we become very emotional. Sometimes it's just, just be realistic. You know, sure. and, and, and focus on the goal, um, yeah. and, and that that helps, and and that yeah. that means then you need to constantly be looking at it. I mean, I I don't necessarily do vision boards, but um, if you look, I have a <laughs> I, I have a, a bike here, the, the spinning bike. Um, yeah. So when we did the um, Guinness World Record, I bought the spinning bike, and we were all zooming and team working and, uh, and whatever. Yeah. I just switch yeah. off my camera and I'm going because I don't want to find myself in that compromising position and thinking, I wish I had trained a little bit more. Wow. Because, you know, something like every 70% your, your, your mental yeah. and 30% your physical training. But the more physically trained you are, the more comfortable you are mentally and ready you are mentally for anything, right? Sure. Because, and, and also, as opposed to when I first started, where I just visualized myself on the summit, I also try and visualize what if a crevasse opens? How am I going to deal with that? So okay. when something happened, it may not happen exactly like I visualized it or I thought about it. I have strategies in my toolbox to yeah. deal with those uncomfortable positions. Oh, what if my shaper gets hurt? What am I going to do? Okay, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not going to dwell on it because it's, it's really a negative but I am yeah. going to think about it and come up with a plan on how I'll handle it. So when it happens, you, yeah. you don't sometimes have a lot of time to think. It, sure. it needs, you need to go into autopilot, but you sure. can't go into autopilot on things that you've never really thought about. It. Sure. Oh, that's very good. That, so I'm, I'm imagining, you know, some say someone is, is one, wanting to bring this uh, to their situation. They have a big presentation and maybe there's someone in the room they know that person is going to nitpick and and kind of I don't know derail them. So you almost imagine what they're likely to going to say and then have a plan instead Absolutely. of being hot and 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 flustered in the moment. Yes. Absolutely, I, that's actually a brilliant example. You you come up. They could ask this. They could ask that. Also practice. I mean, if it's a presentation, practice in front of people that you are comfortable with, and yeah. also have the confidence to say. That's a brilliant question. Can I get back to you on that? And you write it down and you get back to them. Because <laughs> otherwise, they'll look bad if you confidently respond and say you get back to them and they become unreasonable. They won't do that. Yeah, yeah fair, 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 fair. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, so so um, if I trace your journey, you started climbing a little bit late. You didn't start in your, like, in your no. teenage years, no. et cetera. Uh, if in someone... my teenage years, I, I, I used to hike. I was part of a, um, like a scouts, but they're called pathfinders in my church. Um, no. I was actually a master guide in there. Um, so you'd learn notes and you do hiking. Not that I loved it because they were not very nice. They would take you for two, we two weeks in a year in the middle of nowhere. We had no tents, so we'd just make temporary shelter. Uh, yeah, but, <laughs> but I think um, I started really climbing when I turned 40. And I went oh. back to that because that's that's where I was alive. I feel. Wow, wow. So, so this means anyone listening to us can start climbing. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyone, if, if that's something you want to do, start from where you are. Start and with 
you know, walking, uh, hiking in your neighborhood, and uh, you, you want to do a little bit more, do a little bit more, um, you know, but just train for it. And, and every mountain um, is different. You know, there's okay. some that are technical, some that are not technical, some that are technical, but you need to do a bit like rock climbing somewhere. You just need to juma yourself up. So yeah. every mountain that comes along, um, you need to handle it differently. What does train training, it differently. What does training look like? Is there like a training plan? or something it, it depends on, on what so if i'm doing chili um yeah. for example um chili is not technical it's really a hike um, most people do it very quickly so I, i've actually trained now I'm, I'm, I'm guiding and i'm leading locally yeah. uh, and i'm leading teams um in uh, on kilimanjaro every space camp and so forth yeah. um so if you look at Kili, it's not technical. Many people underestimate it. They try and go, let me just climb it quickly and go back to work. Uh, but it's closer to the equator. So the, the, the effect of altitude that we spoke about earlier uh, no. is stronger on Kili than it is uh, in the Himalayas, for example, which is further away from the equator. So uh, I, I personally believe that it's, it's better to climb Kili for at least seven days to allow okay. their acclimatization, have an active uh, uh, rest day, which is yeah. stuff that happens on bigger mountains that for me and my teams, I'm actually incorporating those things um, in there. Yeah. Um, so with Kili, one would need to, a little bit of cardio, you okay. know. Um, the one hour training in the gym only is not sufficient. You also need to train, go and, and hike with a backpack for six, 10 hours because the summit day is long. It can be between 12 to 18 hours, depending on how fast or slow you are. Now, if all your training was one hour, one hour and a half in the gym, how do you now for eight hours, you need to be on your feet. So you okay. kind of need to incorporate some long hikes um, within that. Core yeah. strength is quite important. The, yeah. these, these mountains are kill you get a lot of support. So you don't necessarily need to carry a heavy backpack. Um, okay you probably would carry a maximum of five, seven, you know, your day pack and the rest yeah. is carried by, 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 by the porters. Yeah. Um, so you, you train for it differently. There is no, you don't need crampons. You also okay. need gear. I always say there is no such thing as uh, bad weather, just bad gear, you know. <laughs> also they need to know which time of the year am I going? Is it going to be raining? Is it going to be yeah. windy? you know, um, and, and, and obviously uh, manage uh, for that. And, sure. and when you move on to Everest, it's, it's a totally different uh, story. There's technical climbing, um, okay. but the type of technical cl climbing is, is totally different to um, the technical climb that you find, for example, on, on Mount Kenya. If you're doing the climbing peak, you can do the tracking peak, which is a little bit like Kili, or you can okay. do the climbing peak where you need to actually know rock climbing. Um, okay. as an example. So, so every mountain is different and, and the type of training will depend on where you are going. Um, yeah. You know, rather over prepare and yeah. enjoy. I mean, we most, most people actually go to these places once in a lifetime. Don't you yeah. want to enjoy it? You don't want sure. to, I don't remember how I got to the summit, like really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of people are here saying, but time, no man, yes. we have 24 hours in a day. Eight yeah. hours is for the boss that pays the, puts food on the table. 16 is yours. You can give eight to sleeping, but I don't know anyone who sleeps eight hours really. But yeah, <laughs> what's happening with those eight? What are you doing with them? Netflixing. Maybe the, the, the climb is not important. So whatever it is that's important to you, you have enough time um, yeah. to, to manage it. You just need to make the time, unless if it's sure. not important. All right, so we, re we got to the top of the hour. Just tell me about your book. Where can we find it? And um, yeah, and uh, and and uh, a lovely, lovely. Just kind of tell tell us so, a, a bit. So, like I said, it's a memoir. Uh, my journey is yeah. really about me, which may be boring. Um, it's about my life, um, my journey. It's also showing that uh, you know we're not ordinary people. We are extraordinary people, and being ordinary is a choice. And the sure. lessons that I learned along the way. Um, you can find it at exclusive books. I have it on my website. If you buy from me, I autograph it and send it to you. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to read you the last uh, 
paragraph of the book. Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. So at the end, after I do my, my journey and I do the lessons, I end with good luck. Okay. Every one of us has his or her own personal mountain to climb. It might not be Everest and it might not be a physical mountain. Yours might be in the boardroom, on your bicycle, at school, in your family, or even in the health of your own body. The reality is there's always something that we need to achieve, something big, something meaningful, something difficult. Whatever it is, continue to believe in your limitless potential because the summit is possible if you keep stepping. I believe that we are all extraordinary and have the capacity to do extraordinary things in our lifetime. Whatever your personal Everest, I wish you strength, purpose, kind weather, and some luck, but more importantly, God's blessings. And when you get there, remember to be thankful, reach down and pull someone else up with you. Oh, lovely. Love that a lot. Love that a lot. Yo, Sarah, I feel like we need like four hours of this of this conversation there's just so much there so much there so um i'm a i'm also i think similar to you gallup uh strength coach uh do you want to talk about how people can perhaps access you to maybe do your the assessments i mean i cannot imagine you know someone having these strengths but they don't know about them yeah. and therefore Perhaps they are fixating on their weaknesses. Um, how, how do people get to find out what their strengths yeah. are and how do you unpack that for them? Yeah, so I, I they can reach me on or through my website, www.sarakumalo.com. Um, I, do, I do an assessment. Obviously, I'll do a discovery call to try and figure out um, where you are, what you're trying to do, um, and uh, we figure out where you are, where you need to go, but we start looking at your strength. That's the, the first point. We figure out what your strengths are. We, uh, I do that through um, the, the tools that Gallup gives. So we do an assessment that a client would do. There's no right or wrong answers. You just answer. And once that comes through, we analyze it. And I help the clients to understand their strength, to own their strength and aim using those strengths. That will help them move from where they are to where they need to be, actually to where they deserve to be wow. optimally. And, wow. and I try and use lessons from the mountain as well in the process to try and help them set goals. And, and I'm quite, I'm an accountability partner in the process, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and we, we make sure that we hold each other accountable. What I love about the strength finder process is that we're not teaching people to fish. I don't want them to be continuously dependent on me. We're teaching sure. them to understand themselves so that sure. when situations arises, they know what to tap into. They understand what other strength they need to partner with in order to achieve the success that they deserve. Lovely. I love the success they deserve, peace. Um, and lastly, just maybe for, for our listeners, how many mountains, how many high altitudes mountains have you climbed and how many more still to come? So in terms of the seven summits, I've done six of the seven summits. I'm doing the last one now in April. Uh, I will be the first Black African woman to finish the seven summits. And I'm also skiing to the North Pole um, because before COVID, I skied to the South Pole. And that okay. is called the Explorer Grand Slam. At the moment, there are 72 people in the world that have done the Explorer Grand Slam. And I'm hoping to join that club. And I'll be the first African woman to do so. And in the process, raise money for education. Um, wow. And, and I, I'm hoping that, look, it's taken me long to get here from 2012 to now I'm still going through this journey that people like me, people like my son will be able to do it faster, to be able to do it quicker when they pitch on the mountain or on a polar expedition, they are not looked at as if they didn't belong. They're given sure. the same benefit of the doubt that a white man is given. Wow. Okay, Sarah, this has been absolutely inspiring. <laughs> I am inspired properly. Um, and we'll encourage everyone to get to your book and uh, I'll go get my hands onto the book as well. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey and your insights so, so, so generously. Thank you. I appreciate your time and thank you for the work that you are doing. It's in important for us to tell African stories. So, yeah, well. um, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> Wow.